Well, that's pretty good. Let's now go to multi-axial loading. How do I use this concept in multi-axial loading? And so if we think about plasticity, what do we do in plasticity? What we do is we say, fine, I don't care how complicated the loading is here, we calculate an effective stress, right? We calculate a Mises stress and a Mises strain, and we can then <coughs> write the material stress strain curve in terms of these Mises stresses and Mises strains. So everything is fine. So why don't we do the same thing with Neuber's rule? So, okay. So I now say, fine, it's a plasticity problem. So of course this must be right, right? The effective stress here, right, calculated elastically, must be equal to the product of the real stress, effective stress, times the real effective strain. And I have changed the equation just a little bit in that I now just use the effective stress squared here because it's an elastic solution and I recognize that the effective strain times the modulus is equal to the effective stress and so I stick a modulus over here and let that be squared. Fine. That's the first equation. Oh, what is the effective stress? So I calculate the effective stress, and let me do this just in a two-dimensional problem. And so my two-dimensional problem will be the effective stress is sigma x squared plus sigma y squared plus sigma x minus sigma y, and so on and so forth. So what I have is I have an unknown sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, right? or sigma x and unknown sigma x and sigma y, and I don't know the shear stress time. Fine, so let's start to do I can't calculate the effective stress here. I can calculate it here, but I can't calculate the stress components here. All right, so next thing I do, I say, well, okay, there's a relationship between these two in the effective stress, and that comes from the stress-strain curve. Okay? Right? So from the stress-strain curve, I get, okay, the effective strains are equal to effective stress divided by E, and here's the plastic strain. And then I say, all right, I know about all this wonderful plasticity, so I'll write some constitutive equations, doesn't matter which ones I write, but I have a relationship between sigma x and epsilon x, sigma y and epsilon y, and tau xy and gamma xy. And so those are the equations I can write. But now I have a small problem, in that you can see I managed to come up with five equations relating all of these stresses and strains and stress components, but I have six unknowns. I don't know sigma x, sigma y, or tau xy, and I don't know epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy, and since I don't know all of these, right, I can't calculate that. And I don't have enough equations to solve either. So I'm kind of stuck. I'm kind of stuck in how do I deal with something that has a multi-axial state of stress with this really handy little, little rule of calculating plastic strains. So there are a few things that we could do. And the first thing we could do is we could uh, just completely ignore plasticity theory and say that the ratio of the strains in the plastic region is the same as the ratio of the strains in the elastic region. And that would lead to some problems. For example, I mentioned before when I talked about uh, the constitutive equations, if I took this bar and I put a static load on it and then I twisted it, while I was twisting it, this bar would get longer. And of course, if you do something like that, that's just not possible. Just not possible. So most people, most people don't do that. Uh, Hoffman and Sager had a pretty good idea, and they said, well, look, think about the principal stresses. We always order the principal stresses. Sigma 1 is the biggest, sigma 2 is in between, and sigma 3 is the smallest, right? And the smallest frequently will, might be in compression. And they said, well, let's just make the ratio of the second principal stress constant. And that's a minor stress in the problem. The major principal stresses are sigma 1 and sigma 3, so if we make a mistake on what sigma 2 is, it's not a big error. It's not a big error. And you can see this gives me another equation. Or I could do the same thing with strains. Right. This, gives me another, this gives me another equation. And that works okay if, whenever you have loads which are in phase and proportional. As soon as you go to non-proportional loads, that turns out to be a bad idea. So Glenk 
Volga uh, tries to calculate the strain energy density, and this is kind of like applying Neuber's rule, and so rather than measure the area under this triangle, remember this was the maximum stress, you say, just do this in an incremental way. So there's an increment of elastic strain energy that's calculated, and that will lead to some increment in what the stresses are and what the strains are. And when you write it out, then that's what it, that's what it looks like. And, well, that doesn't look too bad. A little messy, I guess. But when you actually solve all the equations involved, there are four roots. And there's no method other than prior experience, you know, which of the four roots to guess is the correct solution, and it's never always the same root. So this is one of those things that's pretty clever, and all the math works out until you really, really try to uh, solve it. But some, some people like to try the, this idea straight energy density. Yes. Uh, I, I always do something different, of course in that I had an idea about the structural stress. And I like all these plasticity things since I've been doing it since I was a graduate student. And so I thought about the idea that we could eliminate all of the, all of the uh, problems with the extra equation by thinking about this in a, in a new way. Right. Here, here's the... So suppose I suppose I think well, there's my material, and I think about in my material that I just have some little blobs of some sort, and I load this with some stress and some strain, and this is the macroscopic stress and strain. But if I look inside the material, then this stress and strain doesn't exist anywhere. It's the average of everything that happens inside. So why not think about? a complex geometric shape as just being a simple material, just like this. So what happens is I have, for example, I have the elastic solution of stress and strain. For example, that motor carrier. And I can take this elastic solution, which we call the pseudo-stress, and I know that there is some relationship between the elastic stress that's calculated and what the local strain will be. And if I knew what that local strain will be, and I knew the materials stress strain curve like this, then I could tell you from the elastic solution, I first could calculate what I thought the local strains are, and from the local strains, then I could calculate what the local stresses are. And I could just do this in a, in a plasticity model. And in fact, that's what most of the software, software does. We essentially run a plasticity model twice. The first time we run a plasticity model in stress control. The second time we run a plasticity model in strain control with the first results. And we don't have to worry about Neuber's rule. We don't have to worry about uh, how many variables you have. You can have all six components of stress and strain. Uh, the only trick is figuring out what this curve is. What is this curve that ties the two together? Well, we're not all that clever. Why don't we use the uniaxial load case as a way to get that curve, for which we know everything, and that's exactly right. So it's easy for us now to take a very complicated structure, say the motor area that I showed earlier, and uh, do an elastic analysis, and then use all of our plasticity uh, algorithms to be able to tell what are the elastic plastic strains everywhere, everywhere in this body. Okay, so that, that's what happens. That's, that's kind of what it looks like. You end up with essentially treating the, treating the whole structure as a lump of material, and then you also have the second run through plasticity, then you treat the real, real material. So I wanna, I wanna finish this just with some stress intensity factors for cracks growing in biaxial uh, loading, and just to remind you, because you will need this for the quiz, that right, those are the stress intensity factors as a crack goes around from the edge, and one of the things that you see once the crack gets very far away from the edge, right, 50% of the radius, there's a 
absolutely no effect, right? These, these are all the same. And at the effect of a stress concentrate, the effect of the state of stress between torsion, tension, and torsion, tension, and biaxial tension is confined to right around the edge of the hole. Right? If you actually look at the differences in state of stress and start off with this very small uh, crack size, I don't remember what I chose, <coughs> coming out from a hole from a very small crack size, in this case I uh, put a one millimeter crack at the edge of a 10 millimeter hole, you can see there's not a huge change in life. And again, this idea that uh, crack growth is not so sensitive to uh, multi-axial load. Alright, so there's the notches, there's the summary of what we talked about. So we talked about uniaxial loading producing multi-axial stresses, and then we said there are a lot of multi-axial loading just produces uniaxial stresses around the edges of notches because there are no stresses normal to the free surface. And because of that, then I make this assertion that multi-axial stresses are not very important in thin plate and shells because the state of stress around those is always uniaxial and the crack growth is independent of this uh, T stress, right, the other stress. So it's pretty much a uniaxial problem. And they're also not so important in, in crack growth. Where multi-axial problems come in are things which are solid-like structures. These shafts and turbine blades and lump lumps of mass put into some useful shape. Uh -huh. So now I want to give you the tool to do this. There you go. When I when I start doing the seminars, and people want to try some of these things, and uh, I, su I suspect that there's very little hope of any of you doing any of these constitutive models to try something and so on. And so, about maybe more than five years now, I started to put together a website to make it easy to do these calculations and so you can try all of those things. So the things we have talked about in the last day, uh, you, you can actually do. And then the website just kind of grew to take a life of its own, as you might guess. So if you want to do fatigue calculations, then go to the website efatigue.com. Uh, and uh, most of the time you don't have to, you don't have to sign in. I'm going to sign in because it allows me to do some special things. sections depending on what you wish to do. If you want to do something simple, then there's a constant amplitude section. And if you want to analyze a big long loading history, then you can go to variable amplitudes uh, section. And if you want to put in a finite element model as the input for all of the stresses, then you can go over there. And then there's a whole section on multi-axial, which I'll talk about a little bit. If you want to uh, do probabilistic analysis, then there's a full probabilistic on all the different methods, stresses, stress life, strain life, and so on, that will do that. And uh, there's some high temperature stuff and welded structures, and you need some special treatment of cast iron. So let's <clears throat> I'll first just show you what happens for the you go to constant amplitude uh, section. Right. It tells you a lot about doing this, and the whole structure of e-fatigue is it's meant for, not for people like me, but it's meant for people who do this for a few hours every once in a while, as opposed to somebody who wants to do fatigue calculations all day, every day. If you want to do something a few hours every once in a while, 
which I suppose is most people, then you need some help. And so, first of all, you can choose what methods you want to use, what kind of analysis, and then built into this, then there are some what we call uh, binders. So you might want to be able to find stress concentration factors, and of course nobody knows where to look them up in a book, so they're all in there. And so I did that, and he produced one of these drawings, and he said, oh, that was pretty interesting. And I said, oh, no, Michael, there are 50 of them that I want. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just how it is. I mean, this is, but this is the philosophy of, of it, you know, to make as much as possible uh, accessible by the non-expert who doesn't want to go off and find all that stuff and all, all this useful stuff. There's a whole bunch of them for... Uh, Stress intensity factors and all that kind of stuff. So since we've been talking about multi-axial fatigue, if you want to go and use those models, then we talked about the stress life and the, and the strain life, and you can also do this in, in variable amplitude. We might as well just do constant amplitude stuff because it won't take very long to, to run. Uh, when I started to do computer work, you know, the, uh, and learn about finite elements, there was a big manual of test problems. And I like that concept, and so built in everywhere to e fatigue is the concept of learn by example. So it will completely load an example problem which you could run, and there's discussion about it. So I'll just put in the learn by example, I don't know which one it is, but these yellow things come up and say, okay, it just tells you what to do. Right? You can have different kinds of uh, entries, and it puts in the, puts in the numbers. Uh, for you, you can play around with those uh, numbers, and it will show you the loading history. And so here's the loading history, I guess, of tension and, and torsion, and so that kind of stuff is there. And there are... Materials are some databases uh, built, built in, and we'll hear a little bit about that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, I also built this system with the idea to use whatever I know. You know, when I do an analysis, if I didn't know the material properties, I would guess. So, you know, I would ask you, well, tell me, what is it, aluminum or steel? So you start with that philosophy, and so that's what's built in this. If you entered a little bit of information then it will guess its best estimate of what the material properties are, and it will tell you what, what they are. So you can see I put in only the ultimate strength here, and the rest of the stuff you can guess. And fine, and finally it will tell you there's the SN curve it used, and finally you get uh, calculate. And since I don't know the right answer, I say, well, here's what would happen if you calculated based on some of the different theories. And I guess if I calculate with some of the different theories, um, well, first let me talk about this one. The Dang Van model uh, gives you a safety factor, not a fatigue life. So if the fatigue life is finite, you get a number here that's less than one. So that number is out of place. And uh, the, this is uh, calculating with the very pessimistic method. The most pessimistic, was this, which is this mean circumscribed ellipse I talked about yesterday. And the others, I guess, if I saw these kinds of numbers from the different theories, I'd have a reasonable confidence that the lifetime of this would be about 100,000. <laughs> and that's why I give the different life estimates, because it's really comforting when you have two, three models give you about the same answer. And so I always do that rather than just give a single, single answer, and, and so it's there. Well, by the way, after you've done this once and learned by example, 
then it gets pretty tedious reading all of this stuff in instructions. And so if I went back up to the top, I could click the experienced user. And what you will find is that all those annoying instructions go away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after you've done it two or three times, you don't need to be led through. You just say, fine, I know what the boxes mean. And that's, that, that was built everywhere, everywhere behind this in all the different, in all the different ways of doing it. And finally, that was good enough. Presumably, an experienced user will not want to run the learn by example problem. I just ran it now for using all the different uh, strain models, and I ran it that way so that I didn't have to type in all the stuff here uh, for it. Because I don't want to talk about the input. You can look at that, but just show you the kinds of outputs. So I just have a little loading history here, a little out of phase loading history. all those different planes. So, okay. so I, as I mentioned, I put in a lot of phase loading history, but you can see the different models that we talked about uh, yesterday for that little history, and it gives you a life estimate for the models that I think are pretty reasonable. And again, you can see the numbers are pretty good, so I have a lot of confidence in that. Now you also get out of it. what the damage is on different planes, and so you can see how the damage is uh, distributed. Make those plots. There's some plots of the stress-strain modeling that come out. And finally, at the end, the list of the, list of the input data. So, uh, having shown, shown you this tool, I will only tell you without running it, I could do the same thing and just use the finite element as the input, upload the model, send the model off to the calculation engine, just does all that, just does all that stuff. So if you want to do the fatigue calculations, then I think they are very easy. They are very easy because there's lots of software uh, that's, out, that's out there. And you can also go to the commercial codes for doing this kind of stuff, but they're a little bit expensive and take a few weeks to learn to use. So okay, so I will, I will the history. This is an airplane that was designed by Lockheed, and as soon as they finished designing and testing this airplane, then Boeing came out with the jet airplane, and that's what everybody bought. And so there was no use for this airplane, and so they redesigned it a little bit and sold it for these kinds of applications. And so this you recognize as a drop of fire retardant on uh, forest fires. There are some other, there are some other uh, versions of this airplane. There's another version of the airplane. It has, it has some problems in that uh, uh, this airplane has to fly for another 10 years, even though it's 50 years old. And it has to fly for another 10 years because that's how long it takes to build a replacement. Uh, the replacement airplane for this will be built around the Boeing 737 airframe. But for 10 years, this thing has, this thing has, to, has to fly. And of course, it's, it's built full of, full of cracks. And you know, the design of such is it has some big engines that stick out here, and so as I've been uh, talking the last couple of days, when, when this flies and the wings uh, twist, and of course when it lands it gets a big uh, bending cycle and so on. And we have some idea about what the real loads are on the uh, airplane. These are the bending stresses and uh, shear stresses that in, in the wing. I suspect you don't recognize that very much, and I'd like to show this in a little bit better uh, view. And this is the view plotting the shear stress and bending stress uh, during flight. Uh, I've been to several of their meetings, and they have some fascinating things. Do you know when a pilot takes the airplane he is, and comes back from one of these firefighting runs, then the pilot is shown a video 
of how he flew up over the mountains and so on with all the stresses so that the pilot can learn the kinds of things he did to put really high stresses in the wings. And they do that because they want these to last longer. So if the pilot knows what events cause a lot of stresses, then he stops doing those things uh, in it. Anyway, this represents uh, flying for, uh, I don't know, a very long time, I mean months. And uh, so this is the entire loading history for months. And if you look at the entire loading history, you don't, it's too hard to make out what really happens. And so I made some special plotting software that would plot the entire loading history in the background. And that's this gray stuff. So you can see the envelope of operation. And then this is the short flight segments, about three or four flight segments from the preceding plot. And when you look at this with bending stress on the bottom and shear stress there, you can see what it does. You know, it spends a lot of time in the wing bends and so it flaps like this and so on. And uh, every once in a while it goes through some big twisting cycles. So primarily bending and every once in a while some, some twisting cycles. And this is, this is the problem. You, it's got a whole bunch of cracks in it. And uh, of course they worry about these cracks growing uh, failure. And, these, and so these are just diff different rivets clearly see a crack that was coming from the side. So that's what the, that's, that's what the problem is. And uh, nobody has any idea whatsoever uh, what is the influence of these torsional loads from time to time. Yeah, but there's a little bit more of a, of a problem. And the problem is when they use the standard uh, life assessment they use in the aircraft industry, and uh, it does not predict any of the failures that they see. So this is a little disconcerting for the people who are flying airplanes. So you have, by analysis, they try to show the plane is safe to fly, but when they actually test their analysis on some coupons, it doesn't work very well. So no one knows how to deal with these problems. And if you look in the literature, there's absolutely no data about what happens if you have uh, cracks which are growing, and every now and then you put on some big shear cycles. No idea what's no idea what's going on. So let me tell you what I let me tell you some known things. And so I just assembled a few known bits bits of information. Right? And so you've seen about the you've seen about the hole in the plate, and of course we can calculate all of the stresses. So we, you know we have all the equations to be able to do that, and. I showed you a little bit earlier about the stresses around that edge of the hole, and also that if you have a hole which is subjected to uh, both tension and uh, shear loadings, that the stresses become higher and the orientation, the principal stress changes directions. By the way, this is the only thing the analysis got right. By taking the loading history, it shows the principal stress direction is oriented at about 20 degrees relative to the wing, and that's where all the cracks are coming out of the hole at 20 degrees at the wrong lifetime, but at least we got the right, at least we got the right, at least we have the right angle. And, okay, so there's those different, different locations. So, of course, what happens is, when you know, when it's flying doing this, it's damaging one spot around the rivet, and when it's twisting, it's damaging something else. And, of course, some combined twisting, you know, damage yet at the other third place. So everything, all the events don't damage the same locations in the airplane. Okay. And, I, and I showed you this. And, well, we know about cracks growing away from holes, and so we know the area that we are interested in is up near the hole, by the way. So a rivet, a rivet hole is... Uh, about eight millimeters, and if they find any, if they find any cracks that are of about the same size, then they have to repair them, so they don't allow these cracks to grow beyond ten millimeters. And it's mandatory that they do that. That's why, by the way, they don't want to look too closely. If you look too closely and find cracks, you have to repair them. Remember that next time you fly. No, I won. <laughs> okay. So, 
I went to my tell you about the material. Of course, the wing is made. The wing is made of aluminum, and you can simulate the wing. There's a tube. That's a tube about that big around. And uh, you put a hole in it like a rivet, and you watch how cracks grow. And uh, one of the things that you see, if you watch how cracks grow, so they're not very good pictures, but if you have tension, then you get a mode one crack at the edge of the hole, and it grows out like that. If you have combined loading at this 20 degrees, and it grows out like that. If you have uh, torsional loading, then it grows out at 45 degrees, just where you would expect. So this is some, this is a material such that the dominant mechanism is the growth of cracks on planes of the maximum principal stress. <laughs> and it doesn't make a whole lot of difference what loading mode you use, tension or combined or torsion, right? The lifetimes are about the same if they have the same principal stress. Right, so, so we know all of that. I guess one other thing I did not talk about, but that we know, and those familiar with fracture mechanics will know this, that you can imagine what happens, suppose I have something growing in mode one, and we'll talk about this in a minute, and then I switch to some shear loads, what happens? Of course, since the principal stress direction is, is different, then the crack may branch like this. And if you look at the stress intensity solution for a branched crack, it's much lower than a straight crack. So this means that if I have a crack that is growing and it tries to branch and go off in another direction, that that might mean the lifetimes are very long because the effect of this branching of the crack will reduce the stress intensity factor. And you can imagine if you are trying to uh, keep the airplanes flying for a long time, that that might be an important uh, phenomenon. So those are the kinds of things that we know, right? But here are what we uh, don't know. <laughs> what will happen? <coughs> what, what will really happen? So you can think about, I have this coming out of the edge and there will be some cracks in the airplane. And so I can, I showed you the pictures of how it grows. It probably grows in, in tension. Uh, that's there. But we also, once nucleating a crack, it might try to turn and always grow off perpendicular to the bending direction. So we don't know what is really the role of the role of the shear stress. So what, what are the what are the opportunities? So you can think about this. Well, first of all, there are some variable amplitude loading. And of course there are some very variable phase loadings in this. And the failure location is variable. And well Maybe a lot of life is spent in nucleating cracks and small crack growth, and then there are some <coughs> crack propagation and long crack problems, and well, there might be some environmental issues. Right? An idea of the issue. <coughs> now for the quiz. <laughs> right? Since I think quizzes should be learning experiences, and uh, you are PhD students, and you have to always seize an opportunity. So I think everybody in the room can make a contribution to this problem. Right? So what I would like you to do for the quiz, first of all, is to divide yourselves into groups of three or four people. Okay, so group quiz. And there's only one rule in the formation of the groups. You can't work with someone of the same institute. Because I want you to work with new people, not your friends. Because you will learn, you will learn different things. So th that is the only rule. And the quiz is is to take the next half hour or so and produce a one-page, really good research idea. Right? What would you do if I were standing here telling you that I had two hundred thousand euros to solve this problem? Because you know these are opportunities that, that I have had. I've gone to places and they said, "Well, how could you help me?" Oh, give me something short, on very short notice. So think about this activity of how you might go about making a contribution to any of these problems. Okay? And write it on one page. And after a half hour or so, then we can discuss the good ideas of things that you have come up with. And, gee, you know, maybe this is what happens and this is what happens. Because there's not a right answer to my quiz. Right? is just thinking about from your background and things you have learned, what would you do if somebody were sitting here saying, here's a big pot of money to research this problem, okay?